Okay, let's get underway. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome on behalf of the European Policy Centre and the German Council on Foreign Relations, DGAP, to this online policy dialogue on the EU after Germany's Corona presidency, taking stock and identifying challenges for 2021. My name is Jackie Davis. I have the privilege of moderating this final event of Project Presidency, the last in a series of joint activities organized by the DGAP and the EPC together in recent months to discuss key policy issues during the German presidency of the European Union. Uh, there was, of course, the project's public launch in June, where we discussed priorities for the upcoming presidency, four joint roundtables on key issues that the presidency has had to tackle, the recovery fund, the UK-EU relationship, relations with China and the European Green Deal, all with the aim of connecting the EU policy debate in Brussels and in Berlin and indeed across Europe. And for that reason, although I have with me three German speakers today, this event is being conducted in English because once again we are being joined by people from across the European Union. Totally interactive conversation over the next 60 minutes as we assess Germany's achievements over the last six months while it's been at the helm of EU business and look forward to the challenges ahead. Housekeeping before we start, it'll be entirely interactive as I said, questions from me and then I hope also from all of you. You are all muted for now, but if you want to ask a question, you can do it one of two ways. Click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and write your question and please, please, please be brief. Twitter length or less would be great so I can see at a glance what you want to know. If you'd like to intervene orally, just put, click on the raised hands button and I will unmute you when the time comes. I won't ask you to activate your cameras, so if you are watching us in what may be called leisure wear, don't worry, we won't be able to see you, we will just hear you. And if you have technical issues, can you please use the chat button and our fabulous support team behind the scenes will try to help you. So if you can't hear, you can't see us, uh, contact them that way. So. Um, one last thing I should mention, this event is being recorded for internal follow-up purposes. So with me to discuss the last six months, the state of the union now and what lies ahead, delighted to welcome Ambassador Michael Klaus, who is the permanent representative of Germany to the EU, Dr. Daniela Schwarzer, Director of the German Council on Foreign Relations, DGAP, and Yanis Emanulidis, Director of Studies at the European Policy Centre. So we're going to start by taking stock. Uh, and Ambassador, if I could turn to you first of all. Before the presidency began, many people described this as a make or break moment for the presidency. As you moved into the hot seat, what probably seems like a very long six months ago, is that how it felt to you? And where are we now? I was very struck that the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, said at her summit press conference, I've rather enjoyed the council presidency. Uh, have you enjoyed <laughs> it or would enjoy be the wrong word? <laughs> Sir. Well, good afternoon uh, from Brussels. So I think, uh, well, I did also enjoy, but uh, also I must say I'm relieved now that uh, in two weeks time <laughs> it's going to be over. And yes, I mean, uh, make it or break it presidency. So we were faced uh, with an unprecedented crisis in Europe at the very beginning of our presidency. And uh, as you might recall, at the end of the first semester of this year, the sanitary and the economic situations were quite disastrous in many, if not in the most uh, member states. So that's uh, the situation we faced, and there was a concern that uh, EU might disintegrate over this, that there was a risk of economic and uh, political collapse, uh, especially of member states, which were most hit uh, by the Corona crisis. And I think the biggest uh, challenge uh, we had to face was uh, to keep the European Union uh, together and to prevent uh, economic uh, collapse. And as you might recall, I mean, the tool uh, to this was uh, next generation EU and the MFF. This uh, huge package of uh, 1.8 uh, trillion, which was as unprecedented as uh, was uh, the, the crisis. And uh, well, it, it took us still uh, five months uh, to get this over the hurdle. And we did face uh, quite uh, a lot of hurdles. First of all, uh, inside uh, the uh, 
On the Council, you might recall that uh, this was uh, in July, uh, the uh, Make It or Break It European Council was the longest ever in EU history. And uh, at several stages, at least I, um, uh, was absolutely convinced uh, that within the next uh, uh, 60 minutes it would be over. Jean-Michel would call for a final meeting and say, we need to meet again end of August or sometime else, we are not going to make it. Well, once we had uh, Mount, uh, had uh, done this hurdle, the next was to find an agreement with the European Parliament. And here the European Parliament did insist um, uh, until the, the very end, I must say, uh, that they would reopen uh, this package. And for us, it was clear this was like reopening uh, Pandora's box and we would have never been able to put this uh, thing together again. And then when we did believe, I mean, everything uh, was done and now we could uh, have this uh, package uh, agreed uh, by member states uh, that there was another problem inside the council on the um, so-called rule of law issue or the conditionality uh, mechanism to be precise. And that is something that uh, we only overcame uh, last week at the European Council. And uh, so I can say we succeeded, but we succeeded narrowly. Thank you. And of course, uh, that your motto when you started together for Europe's recovery, very much reflecting that concern, the potential yes. for disintegration, uh, which, as you say, uh, in the end, uh, you did make rather than break. Um, but I want to come back later to the extent to which that was at the expense of really not being able to do some of the other things that you'd hope to do in the presidency. But before we do that, Daniela, uh, for you um, and your assessment of the last six months overall, we'll delve into some of those details the ambassador mentioned in a moment. But did it turn out to be a break, make or break moment? I'm interested that the ambassador characterizes that summit at the end of July as the moment he feels it really was a moment of truth, as it were. Was it for you and how have they fared? Well, as an observer, I, I, I would agree that had the EU not been able to reach an agreement um, in summer, I think, uh, you know, the, the fall would have been a very tense, politically tense uh, period. And this under worsening corona conditions um, over the past weeks, I think we, we would not be, definitely not be in the place where we are now. I think, yes, the, the German presidency started out by saying this is going to be a corona presidency. That's what the foreign minister sort of put over it as a headline. But I think, you know, beyond crisis management, a number of very important decisions were taken. And I would say the most consequential is indeed linked to the recovery fund and in particular the financing side of it. Of course, the other important thing um, with the recovery fund is that member states agreed that there don't only have to be loans, but actually grants to the EU members. So this recognizes the depth of the crisis and its seriousness, and it could potentially you know, um, alleviate the political consequences to some extent. But the more consequential decision even is that um, the EU went to the markets and used instruments, which it has had in its treaties for a while, but mobilized them for this particular situation. And this is, I think, the most interesting debate going forward, namely when it comes to paying back all the money, how will the EU do this? And are we moving step by step towards a more integrated approach to funding, um, fis using fiscal instruments? And I think we are on track for that and it's a very important discussion to be had. Thank you, and I would like to come back to that in a moment. Um, uh, and Ambassador, of course, as you know, many people calling this Europe's Hamiltonian moment, uh, much debate over whether it was or it wasn't, and I'd be interested to hear what you think. But yeah, before we do that, Yanis, your overall assessment of where we are six months on, are we in a better place than you might have expected us to be when we met and discussed uh, the upcoming presidency and the challenges, or are we still in a pretty dire situation? What is your overall assessment? Well, I think that we're still in a difficult situation and there's still a good number of unknowns. But if I compare it to where we were in June, July, or if you go back further, if we were in February, March, I think that the state of the union is better than it could have been. Um, when you thought through at the beginning of this crisis of potentially what the consequences of the crisis could be, 
both with, with many, with respect to many areas, whether it's health, whether it's the economy, but also with respect to potential political consequences, societal consequences, geopolitical, geoeconomic consequences. Uh, a lot of things have could have gone wrong. Um, compared to the most negative scenario, I think we're at a better situation today. And I think that has also a good, um, one reason which has to do with that has to do with the German presidency, uh, which uh, it I think it was, a, let's call it a lucky coincidence that uh, at this moment in time, with the EU being in the COVID-19 crisis, uh, having the German presidency in place, I think was uh, a lucky historical coincidence because obviously this was nothing anyone had planned. Um, and I think that every presidency needs to show that it is an honest broker, that it's able to bridge building um, and that the German presidency has shown, but it's more than that. It has also shown a good degree of leadership. Uh, the July uh, agreement, which was massive. Um, and if it would not have been taken in July, um, it might have been taken later, but it was massive in terms of its importance. Um, and th thus it was a make or break moment for the German presidency. Um, but uh, it was not uh, something which was uh, decided only in July, was also uh, decided when the German and French decided in May on what their proposal was uh, for this agreement. Um, so it was leadership which was shown by Berlin together with, with Paris, which made that possible. And I think this was the key success, but there were also other things which uh, have been progressing, some maybe not as much as they could have without it being a Corona uh, presidency. But overall, I think um, we are in a better situation today. The German presidency played a great role in that. Thank you very much. And I'll come back on those other areas in a moment. But Ambassador, on that question of was this Europe's Hamiltonian moment? Uh, much debate, some saying no, crisis moment, crisis measures, not a precedent for the future. Others saying, and Daniela, I think, indicating she sees it as a very significant moment. What's your reading? Well, I think only history will tell and we will only be able to see in retrospective uh, whether that was a Hamiltonian moment, but um, I have some doubts uh, at this stage. But I think what we did see was that the EU was able to rise to the challenge and uh, to act uh, in a moment of crisis, deepest crisis. Mm. Um, just in terms of, of whether this was a corona presidency and only a corona presidency, obviously a lot of the focus, not just on the EU's budget and the recovery package, but also on attempting to coordinate uh, the response to COVID-19. Uh, some successes in terms of vaccine procurement and so on, some less than successful coordination. Um, how do you see the response, specifically the health response uh, to COVID and then following on from that, to what extent do you feel this really did end off being a very much a corona presidency or do you feel you were able to progress in other areas as well? Well, it was very much a corona presidency because it did severely impact uh, on our daily uh, dealings here. So uh, first of all, meetings in person had to be reduced massively. Uh, we were working uh, at a maximum of 30% of our normal capacity and we did have much uh, fewer meetings at political level and obviously I mean this does uh, have an impact on decision uh, making and also on finding agreement and it did slow uh, down uh, decision making in several areas, no, no doubt about it. And also, uh, we did uh, have to uh, set new priorities. Uh, it was no longer climate digital and many other things, uh, but it was basically about fighting the pandemic and its effects on economies and also on society. So in some way, it was a permanent uh, crisis uh, management. We did have to improvise. It does not mean that we did not also progress on other areas. Uh, once we had cleared the MFF, um, uh, Next Generation EU Conditionality Mechanism Package hurdle last Thursday, so we were able to, to progress on uh, the climate uh, target. Without that agreement prior, it would not have been possible. That, that was uh, very clear. Uh, we did have progress on the rule of law and fighting terrorism and some other things uh, to, to name uh, but, but a few. But, but uh, clearly uh, it was different priorities and it did slow down things. Mm. Do you have any areas where you particularly regret that uh, because of the situation more progress couldn't be made? Or do you feel broadly you kept on track 
with the most important things the German presidency wanted to achieve, even if you couldn't get as far, as you say, in some areas as you had hoped for? Well, I, I mean, there's some unfinished business, uh, obviously, starting with Brexit, uh, but it's not over yet. Uh, we still have a couple of days uh, to go, so, so, so we'll see. End of year hasn't uh, come yet. <laughs> and I think there's still clearly the possibility of uh, having a deal. Maybe by end of this week, uh, there's uh, at least a chance. Uh, then also on uh, China, I mean, because of Corona, we did have to cancel these um, high level meetings, 27 heads of state of uh, government uh, meeting uh, with the Chinese president, uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, and we tried, we had two goes at it and uh, two times we, need, we had to cancel because of uh, Corona. Then migration, which came up uh, quite late because it had to be delayed because of the uh, MFF Next Generation U program. The focus was all on this, so this gave us quite a uh, uh, little time to to progress on it. And in the end, uh, what we did have is a progress report. We were able to put it back on on uh, uh, rail, but but uh, clearly uh, we would have loved to be a bit uh, more ambitious. And then also uh, another issue, uh, enlargement, uh, but, but that was also because of blockage, blockades uh, inside uh, the council. We were not able to start negotiations with North Macedonia and uh, Albania. Thank you very much. Yanis, you indicated too that you felt it wasn't just a corona presidency, that there was progress in other areas. Where would you highlight uh, the most progress and where would you say uh, really things did have to be put to one side and simply not possible to have the bandwidth to progress on everything. Well, I think that, uh, as the ambassador said, there were areas in which there were progress beyond everything which was related to uh, the multi-annual financial framework, the, uh, the package, the recovery package, um, also the progress that was linked to it uh, on rule of law mechanism. Now, uh, the fact that we now have this new conditionality mechanism in place, I think, is progress. Question is, to what degree it will work, uh, how, what scope it will have, how politically operable it will be. I still have my doubts, but still, this is opening a door in a certain direction. Uh, the fact that uh, the, at the European Council, the last one, the, uh, the December one, uh, there was at the end of the day, and this was a long negotiation, an agreement on, uh, on, on the emissions uh, cuts by 2030. I think that was not an easy thing to do, but there was at least an agreement on that. Uh, if, it, if there would not have been an agreement, I think this would have been sending a wrong signal uh, towards the own European public, but also towards the outside, um, especially now that we have a new administration in the US, what signal would that have been? Um, but that doesn't mean that the thing is settled with respect to uh, how the European Union will be dealing with climate change. There's a lot of things that still need to be implemented. So there is a good number of progress in various areas, um, and in other areas, yes, it didn't go as well as it could have done without COVID. EU China was already mentioned. On migration, I think we have a substantial differences uh, within the council when it comes to the solidarity aspects. And there are uh, many um, member states who are not uh, satisfied or happy uh, with the commission's uh, new pact. So there are fundamental differences, but we've had them in the past. They're not new differences. Um, one, I think... Uh, issue which I would have hoped that we would have come to a conclusion and I'm a bit disappointed, I must say, it relates to the Conference on the Future of Europe. Um, this was something where the German presidency tried um, to get uh, an agreement that at least there would have been uh, an inauguration of the conference process uh, before uh, the ending of the German presidency. That didn't work out. And I think this is a pity because a lot of the things of especially transformational nature um, need a broader discussion, not only at national, but also at European level. Um, and that's, I think, one of the disappointments uh, which I would uh, have in mind when it comes to the German presidency, but that was not um, something the German presidency's of the German presidency's fault. It's more complex. Than Come that. back to that and whether uh, it can be resolved and it can get up and running soon. Uh, but Daniela, for you in terms of successes going beyond Corona, but also areas maybe of disappointment, of unfinished business or not particularly started business. I'm thinking, for example, I mean, impossible to make progress in this presidency on the Migration and Asylum Pact. Uh, there has been a meeting, uh, it's begun to be talked about, but really there was only a certain amount that could be done. Where do you see the balance of, of achievement uh, and disappointment? 
In my view, under extremely complicated conditions, really a lot was achieved. And it's hard to, you know, to now be critical on what could have been done possibly more because of simply the conditions of, of the presidency. If, you know, I had to pick one point where I think um, we, we really have to watch very closely, it would be uh, the deal found on the rule of law mechanism in the EU budget and the recovery fund. Um, I mean, the simple fact that we have seen these negotiations going on the way they have, that two member states block uh, and threaten to veto, I think tells us a lot about where the European Union is and how uh, two leaders have decided to instrumentalize basically this huge deal for domestic reasons. Mm -hmm. And um, the compromise found, while you know, some would argue it's good that we have found a compromise because the political damage would have been enormous and also the economic damage if we hadn't uh, seen this, you know, this compromise struck uh, during the last European Council, that's one way to see it. The other, and this is, I think, where we have to be extremely uh, vigilant, is how this two-year delay in the implementation of the procedure will actually play out, how uh, the two governments that pushed so hard for it, Poland and Hungary, will make use of that situation, and whether at the end of the day, this is a deal that actually doesn't undermine the principle of, of rule of law in the medium term. Um, and I think this is something that if I had a concern about the results of the presidency, this would be one. While I do acknowledge the huge pressure that was there on the German presidency to find a deal and to enable all EU 27 member states to move ahead. But some have argued that it might have been a, an alternative to implement the recovery fund with a lower number of member states, namely only 25 who would agree to the fully fledged rule of law mechanism as it was initially uh, proposed. Um, that decision wasn't taken, but I think we were pretty close to the moment of truth and I, we need to watch out. Mm. Thank you. Ambassador, uh, picking up on that point first on the rule of law, and then I'd like to also come back, if I might, on the conference on the future of Europe. A concern about delay uh, because of the inevitably now this going to the European Court of Justice, although some suggesting maybe it can be done quite quickly, uh, but also that the content, the compromise will really limit the ability to use this mechanism. Um, your reaction to that and also your thoughts on what it meant to be in that situation of two member states uh, holding out and holding up this massive package, this great achievement of July in such a way that the, how do you see the long term ramifications of that? Well, this, this was obviously, I mean, our biggest headache uh, for the last uh, couple of weeks. And uh, here there is a fundamental problem inside the EU. We'll come back to that uh, in a minute. Now, uh, the solution was uh, to not touch uh, the regulation. Uh, so Hungary and Poland had been asking uh, until something like 10 days ago for the regulation to be renegotiated. And we said this is completely impossible. There would have not been uh, 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 agreement among member states and not uh, within parliament. Uh, so in the end, what we had uh, is a clarification. Now, will this uh, delay implementation? Uh, it might be so, but it might also not be so. So clearly, this will go to the European Court of Justice. And uh, as we know, this can take up to two years. Uh, but it's also um, the case that member states or the Commission can ask for a fast track procedure, and then it can be done uh, in uh, two months' time. If it's like in two or three months or in four months, uh, it will not delay anything because anyways, uh, the commission will have to hammer out the guidelines for the functioning of this conditionality. It's not a rule of law mechanism, by the way. It's a conditionality mechanism. So in that case, uh, we wouldn't lose any time at all. So we'll see how long European uh, Court of Justice will need. And then, yes, I think this uh, episode uh, did show that there is a serious split inside uh, the EU and the issue of rule of law has become somewhat also ideological. And that is something uh, that we will have to address and that we will have to deal with. And uh, the German presidency already tried to address it. So we installed in the German presidency now a kind of a annual uh, um, 
uh, rule of law uh, report uh, that is being discussed on an equal basis. You know, uh, this is not directed against one member state, so, uh, but, but uh, every member state uh, will be scrutinized. And that is something we hope will also improve the uh, psychological atmosphere and help uh, to bridge uh, the gap that uh, obviously does exist. And two words on the conference on the future of Europe. Why in the end was it not possible to launch it within this presidency? And are you optimistic uh, about the future? And indeed, uh, a question popping up here. Um, I'm just trying to have a look because it's come into the wrong box. Uh, yes, this is certainly a leftover which needs to be addressed, uh, says Henrik, somebody whose surname I can't read at the moment, apologies. Uh, what mm. held us up and are you confident it can be resolved soon? Well, I, I don't expect it will be resolved in the remaining days of the uh, German presidency. I mean, actually, uh, we were going for it uh, in the in early autumn, and uh, I'm afraid it did fall victim, basically, and mostly to the second Corona wave because it turned the attention away uh, from uh, this issue. So we were back in the crisis management, and uh, uh, so uh, the minds were focused on other things. And also, if you go for a conference on the future of Europe, I mean, yes, you can use video conferences, but if you want to have hundreds or even thousands of participants, uh, you also need to meet uh, in person and clearly uh, uh, in the midst of a second wave that is impossible. So I think the timing was quite unfortunate. One and uh, I guess uh, once uh, uh, we have uh, we are out of this uh, situation, this will pack up again and then uh, this will move rather quickly because most things are prepared and in place. Okay. We'll want to come back in a moment before we move to looking forward to uh, the lessons of COVID. But there is a couple of questions from the audience uh, from Alexandra Karapipiris. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, how can you consider the failure of the German presidency and Chancellor Merkel personally succumbing and accepting the aggressive behavior of Turkey and via her violations of sovereign rights of its member states in the Eastern Mediterranean and contrasting this with the US position and the imposition of sanctions on Turkey. A comment to that, if you would, and then we'll come on to the lessons of COVID. You might uh, recall this was uh, discussed among heads of uh, state and government on uh, Thursday, and that there was a consensus and agreement, including uh, the Greek prime minister, the Cypriot uh, president, uh, for the conclusions uh, that we have. And what they're saying is, uh, well, on the one hand, we remain open. And uh, if uh, Turkey wants to improve the relationship, uh, we stand ready. But otherwise, uh, we are also ready to take uh, tough measures. So uh, there will be sanctions in the context of the drillings in the Eastern Mediterranean. And the high representative has been tasked to report back to heads of state and government uh, in March to see whether additional measures uh, might be taken. So I think uh, we stayed united on this and we did rise to the challenge. Thank you. Yanis, you wanted to come in here. But just in addition to what the ambassador said, I think what we've seen, and we saw that in October, we saw it in December at the European Council, um, that there's a dual approach. Um, let's call it carrots and sticks. On the one side to say, we offer you um, a redefinition of the relationship, I mean, to Turkey, um, and others saying that what you're doing in the Eastern Mediterranean is unlawful, that there is need for more sanctions. And there has been this discussions among the EU 27 of how to balance this approach. Um, and I think that some uh, at the summit uh, of last week were not satisfied with the outcome. They would have hoped that there would have been a more, uh, more aggressive, more firm stance on Turkey. Um, while others were saying, let's give them more time. Let's also give time to the fact that we will have a U new US administration in place from January onwards. And maybe that will also um, change uh, the stance in Ankara uh, with respect to this issue. So gaining time, not only for the purpose of kicking down the can, but also of aspiring that there will be a political development um, um, which might affect the situation in the region, especially with respect to the Turkish stance. Thank you. Daniela, did you want to briefly comment on that? And also, uh, there's a comment come in uh, from the audience. I'm a little bit surprised. Uh, the EU's unified stance on China hasn't been raised as a major success under the German presidency. Could you please elaborate? I don't know whether you could pick up on that point as well. Yes, um, I'm happy to do so. On Turkey, I, I have no further pieces to add, but I'll pick up the China issue. So indeed, I think the EU has moved forward quite a bit, and this goes 
back before the German EU presidency, but I think we saw an acceleration of, of, of the debate, but also the joint positioning under the German EU presidency. Now, on the framing of what China represents, the Commission paper of 219, the Commission communication of 219 was key. And what we have seen under the German EU presidency is to the extent to which this is now really framing uh, the debate and the fact that uh, the uh, 27 EU heads of state and government have actually endorsed this um, in 2020 is an important step forward. During the German EU presidency, the uh, investment screening mechanism came into force. This goes back to the Juncker Commission, but it's now implemented. A number of member states have amended their national laws for investment screening. Um, and this shows you generally that in the EU, there's a larger awareness of the risks that Chinese investment can actually represent. Now, the full EU 27 China summit obviously couldn't take place because of the COVID-19 uh, situation. It would have been an important step and the uh, reasoning behind it to bring all 27 uh, leaders together with the Chinese leadership and the EU institution presidents, I think is a very good idea which should be taken forward because it is a clear measure that is positioned against the efforts of the Chinese government to divide Europeans. Thank and this you. continues. Uh, Chinese campaigns, disinformation in the EU are rising. Um, and it's important to be very clear that China is a partner and a risk to the EU. Thank you very much. Ambassador, I don't know whether you wanted to say anything about China. I'm getting quite a few questions about the presidency and Germany's role. Yanis said earlier it was a lucky coincidence, he called it, uh, that Germany was holding the presidency at this time. Uh, and I've got a couple of questions about after uh, the presidency, do you think that the functions of the presidency could, should be further developed or even changed. Um, do you find the negotiating process has changed to how it was 12 years ago? Um, generally speaking, do you feel it was a real advantage to have such a big and influential member state in the hot seat right at this moment? Could, did it enable you to achieve other things that maybe another presidency couldn't? I mean, first of all, one must uh, see compared to the last uh, German presidency. So there was a rotating presidency and this was it. But but now we have a permanent uh, president of the European Council. We have a, a permanent president of the Foreign Affairs Council, which is uh, the high representative. And uh, on the one hand, uh, that helps uh, to make the whole thing uh, more predictable, stable, efficient. And on the other side, uh, I must also, after six months, <laughs> I say, it makes it also more, more difficult uh, because it just needs much more uh, coordination. I think it did quite well, but uh, so it has its, it has its pros and uh, its cons. And uh, if there's anything that uh, after these uh, almost six months um, in the chair, I, I would uh, wish for is a more qualified majority <laughs> because it is so, so cumbersome <laughs> uh, to, to find agreement. If it's unanimity, there's usually always someone now to, to block or connecting it uh, with other files. So this makes it quite uh, complicated and it does slow down things. <laughs> follow up on that because we heard discussion uh, in the midst of the threatened Hungarian and Polish veto of doing not the MFF but the RFF, the recovery fund, uh, via some form of intergovernmental treaty going outside uh, the normal EU structures. We now hear a lot of talk about more enhanced cooperation if this, this situation persists. Do you believe we are on a track, maybe not to get moving to QMV because of the treaty change involved, but of member states looking for new and creative ways to get around those blockages. Just a thought on that because you, you raised that point. And a quick thought from both of you, and then I'll take a couple of questions from the floor, and then we'll come back to and look at the future and the Portuguese presidency. Ambassador. Well, I mean, uh, as uh, the blockade by Portugal, by sorry, by Poland <laughs> and by by Hungary. 
uh, did continue. I mean, obviously, a discussion started on if there are alternatives, and there were bad alternatives doing it at 25, intergovernmental uh, or enhanced cooperation or whatever, but at 25. And uh, well, uh, that is uh, a bad option, but it's maybe the less uh, bad option. So this was uh, being uh, considered uh, in earnest inside the commission and in the council secretariat and so. And uh, but, but, but clearly, uh, I mean, for us, and this is what I tried to say in the beginning, for us, uh, it, it was so important uh, to keep uh, the European Union uh, together also in these critical uh, last weeks uh, we had. Mm, thank you very much. Uh, Daniela, Yanis, did you want to come in on this question? Yanis. I don't know whether Daniela wants to start this time, maybe. Uh, well, Daniela? Yeah, <laughs> I think um, we will see more of, of differentiated uh, cooperation in the future and foreign policy where the challenges are more pressing than they used to be is going to be the prime example. Uh, you know, we are very far from having a qualified majority vote on foreign affairs. This is not going to happen. And if it did, I don't think the uh, Foreign Affairs Council would make, take decisions. So what we'll see is member states cooperating in, in, in smaller groups on the key challenges. Um, and yes, so on other issues as well, I think uh, it was quite close. If you look at the French positions on the recovery fund, very early on, even in spring, but then also when Poland and Hungary threatened their veto, uh, there are big member states who, who are ready to move ahead in a smaller group, even on such important steps of institutionalizing new financial instruments, as we've seen with the ESM, it's possible in an intergovernmental fashion. And I think uh, rather than not being able to move, this is going to, to be a format uh, that will be more frequently used. Thank you. Yanis? Um, one word on the functioning of the presidency. Uh, as uh, Michel Klaus said, since the entry into force of Lisbon, a lot has changed. But uh, since then, we've seen so many uh, rotating presidents coming and going, and their role has been different throughout these uh, now more than 10 years. Um, and with respect to the German presidency, I think it came during a crisis period. And I think in crisis periods, we have seen that the rotating presidency play a probably potentially stronger role. And when it's a big country, even more so. Um, so that's one of the variables. Um, and the other variable is that I think because of the uh, logistical reasons of how a presidency works or doesn't work at the same level of efficiency during COVID-19 cri uh, crisis, I think that that's another factor which enhances the potential role of the presidency. But that's depending on the overall situation. So it depends on the situation you're in and okay. uh, what role the presidency will be. That it's not something which you can determine on paper and settle for, uh, um, for, the, for the entirety. Now, with respect to intergovernmental solution, enhanced cooperation, for one, it would have not uh, solved uh, the MFF problem. Um, that is not something you could have solved by using option B or C. Um, and I think that if you would have gone in this direction, um, you would have created a situation of 25 versus two, which I think could have structurally been a burden for the European Union. In times of crisis, where we know that the European Council and consensus in the European Council is important, if you would have gone along these road, I think it could have undermined that. And enhanced cooperation, yes, we used it, we used it in the past, but we use it for small issues. Uh, using it for something of this magnitude, I think would have also given a political signal which I'm not sure would have been the right signal uh, during okay. times of crisis. Let's take a couple from the floor. Klaus Wittmann. Klaus Wittmann, can you hear me? Klaus, can you hear me? I have pressed the button that should allow you to talk. Uh, if not, let's try Christoph Sprig. I think you're both joining by dialing in. Uh, so not sure if either of those are working. Uh, Paul Christofferson, can I give you the floor? Hmm. Can anybody behind the scenes help me? No, I don't appear to be able to give anyone the floor at the moment, um, if you could do so. Uh, in the meantime, could I just come back while we're seeing if we can fix that, Ambassador, to the lessons of COVID? Uh, before we move on to look at the challenges for the Portuguese presidency, what for you do you draw as the, the most important lessons? Angela Merkel has already talked about, for her, this issue of the health union and how important it is going to be to discuss this. What would you learn, uh, 
draw lessons would you draw both about where the EU has really succeeded in coming together? We've talked about that in financial terms. I'm now thinking more strictly in pandemic health terms. And where the EU has been less successful. Would you draw any lessons from that? Well, unfortunately, the initial reflex, I think, in most member states was to go for a national solution, closing borders, uh, stop export of medical devices. And I think it didn't take too long for us to find out um, that this was uh, wrong. And uh, so I think that uh, the learning curve was uh, quite steep uh, in, in most member states uh, on this. But, but it shows a little bit um, the principal dilemma uh, we are in. On the one hand, health um, uh, and also the internal borders is a matter of national competence. And on the other hand, it is in all our interest to preserve the Schengen freedoms, uh, to preserve the single market. So the only answer is uh, to that, um, as, as long as we can't change the treaty and go really for uh, something where we uh, give, make this an EU competence, that we will have to, to coordinate. And this is what we tried. Um, this is where we had uh, some progress, like on uh, vaccines, uh, like on uh, testing strategies, uh, but remembering uh, the discussions uh, we had in Corpair, <laughs> I can tell you it's a difficult and cumbersome exercise because of national uh, competences and very different ways uh, to look at things. For example, um, uh, when it comes to, um, no, yes, it's not what I'm, um, uh, whether you have um, uh, lockdowns uh, and uh, these type of things, you have member states uh, which do, you have, uh, or, or, or quarantine is a maybe better example. You have uh, some member states uh, saying, uh, well, uh, if there is a concern, you need to go on quarantine for 14 days, others say nine, uh, then you have a seven and five. You have the Swedes uh, who don't know this at all. So, so this is uh, very difficult uh, because uh, there's very different ways to look at it. And uh, also uh, scientifics are not always uh, of the uh, same opinion. So uh, that is something uh, where we need to, to, to get uh, much better, but, but it's not going to be uh, an easy thing as long as this is not a EU competence, but uh, remains uh, a national competence. Thank you very much. I'm going to try Klaus Wittmann again. Klaus, I have allowed you to talk. Can you unmute yourself? And Am yes. I no? Can you now? Can you now hear me? Beautifully. Yes. yes. Uh, I'm General Klaus Wittmann, Senior Fellow at the Aspen Institute. And uh, I address myself to Ambassador Klaus, and I cannot resist uh, greeting you as the son of my former brigade commander and commanding general. So you can imagine that I have been following very closely your work in China and now in the European Union. Quick question, although it is a side theme in the present time, was it not possible to lay to rest this, the, the fight about words regarding strategic autonomy in security policy and proceed pragmatically. Thank you very much, Niklas. I'm going to take a couple together now in the interest of time. Um, I did have one from Paul Christofferson, but he's disappeared for the moment. If you want to still ask a question, Paul, please put your hand back up. Um, and we also have a question uh, from someone about, uh, Olive Ovrebo was asking about what were the challenges to get to that agreement on the 2030 climate target? No one expected you to have to be up all night uh, when that discussion started. It turned out to be much tougher than expected. Did someone wanted to know what the challenges are? Uh, we have a couple of Brexit related questions, but I will come back to those in a minute. And we have a couple relating to the Portuguese presidency. Uh, but if we could pick up on, on those two points. So the strategic autonomy debate, and I think here being asked very much in the NATO context, in the defense capability context, but obviously also a domestic, uh, or talk about technical sovereignty and so on. Ambassador. Well, first greetings to General Heil Wittmann. <laughs> and uh, well, strategic autonomy and EU sovereignty. Uh, there has been uh, debates at the several levels and uh, well, it, there is no consensus in the European Union. So strategic autonomy, that is a discussion that uh, EU sovereignty that started, uh, came from, from France. 
And uh, clearly here you, you see that uh, especially the northern member states and the eastern member states are quite sceptical because for them it might mean returning to a goalist uh, policy, that it means uh, transatlantic uh, decoupling, and uh, that is a quite uh, difficult uh, debate. And so far there is no common understanding of what it could actually mean. I, I expect this uh, debate to continue for some time because uh, clearly, uh, we need uh, to have a joint understanding about how we safeguard uh, European Union's industrial technology, technological base when it comes to EU sovereignty, not to become uh, totally dependent on uh, the um, uh, giant companies, uh, be they uh, Chinese or the US, especially in the field of uh, digital and the internet and, and all of this. So I think it's a debate we need, but it's a debate that is not going to be easily uh, resolved and where there is a lot of mutual uh, suspicion. Thank you very much. Can I just quickly, Daniela, Yanis, take a couple of these questions about Brexit? Don't want to dwell on it too long. Uh, can't bear the pain anymore. Um, but we have two, two, three questions relating to this from Stephen uh, Erlanger, a journalist. Herr Klaus, congratulations on surviving this one. Uh, he says, could the EU and the presidency do more to prepare for no deal Brexit? There were strains about releasing even these four basic contingency plans. Should there be more? Uh, Daniela, uh, also the same question about EU preparations for no deal. And then a fascinating question from Axel Berg. In what way did the absence of the UK change the conduct of the different negotiations, the many issues we've been talking about so far in this hour, between the 27? Was the atmosphere easier, the same or more difficult? So what is life like? without the UK round the table, put simply. Intriguing question for you all, but uh, let's talk briefly about no deal Brexit uh, and the atmosphere, and then we'll come on to the Portuguese presidency and the challenges. Ambassador first. Well, I mean, obviously, we are uh, preparing for a no deal Brexit because uh, we don't know. As I said, I believe there's a chance uh, to get a deal still done, but uh, at the same time, we need to do our contingency planning and uh, take precautionary measures uh, that we will do in Corapir tomorrow. So we pass, uh, we'll pass a legislative uh, package addressing uh, contingency measures tomorrow, and we expect this to go through Parliament on Thursday, so that we will be fully prepared by end of this week, as much as we can. <laughs> Thank you. And, and not having the UK round the table, has it made a big difference to the way talks are conducted? You're muted. Yes, uh, I mean, uh, obviously, but uh, this already happened, I would say, like uh, two years ago, because you would see even uh, before Brexit happened, uh, uh, beginning of uh, this year, uh, you would see that UK uh, was less and less ready to take the floor and was less and less uh, present. You, you could see this uh, almost uh, hour by hour, day by day or so, getting, getting less and less. And yes, uh, I mean, uh, it's being felt. So, for example, when we talk trade, um, uh, free trade or not so free trade, uh, if we talk about uh, more geopolitical issues, uh, I think here, yes, uh, we, we feel that uh, UK is no longer part of it. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Daniela, in terms of no deal Brexit preparations, but also uh, more broadly than what it's like not having the UK around the EU table, in terms of the EU's ambitions as a geopolitical actor, how big a difference does it make not to have the UK uh, as part uh, of the EU uh, as it seeks to live out those ambitions? And it's quite interesting when it comes to that question. Um, the foreign policy crowd speaks much more about Europe than about the EU, because I do think when we talk to your politics, when we think about uh, the transatlantic relationship, more and more we start to think EU and the UK. And I believe that's you know something we will do more easily as of next year, whenever sort of Brexit is is really concluded, and we know whether there's a deal or there's no deal, that the minds clear to some extent, and we can look forward. Um, I think this could have happened because the, the question was, did we miss out on something? I would say over the past one and a half, two years, we could have maybe advanced on those issues, but 
the attention, the political attention was simply elsewhere and the political polarization over the past weeks has grown to such an extent that maybe we just have to take a deep breath uh, and in 2021 go into those strategic issues. By the way, I do believe that a conversation, including the UK, may make the debate about Europe's strategic autonomy or European sovereignty, as, as the German government likes calling it, may make that more easier because then there's no doubt that this is deeply embedded within NATO and in, in the transatlantic relationship, obviously. And I personally think we should rather talk about capacity to act because that's what it's all about. It's not about a conceptual big frame, but it's about building our ability to decide independently and to implement. And in the field of defense, in the field of technology, we have to catch up as, as the EU. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, then to Yanis, and then Ambassador, I need to come back on the climate question because a number of people saying I forgot to uh, ask you uh, to follow up on that one and what was so difficult. But Yanis, first on Brexit, brief one if you would. Yes, with respect to, um, to Brexit, depending on the outcome, obviously, of negotiations, I am a bit skeptical as to whether this will clear the minds. I fear that uh, if there is no deal, or if there's a very, very thin deal, which will not be sufficient, that there could be a good level of blame game. That um, especially from the perspective of the UK, you will have many who will argue it was Europeans, the EU's fault, and that that could easily get out of hand. And, and I hope that as we have prepared very smartly as EU27 for these negotiations, that we also Politically prepare, politically prepare ourselves once this potential blame game starts so that we coordinate among ourselves of how we react, because if we react in the wrong way, um, the uh, clearing of minds, as Daniela called it, uh, will obviously become something which will be much more difficult. Thank you. Ambassador, two words, if you would, but I do want to then talk about the Portuguese presidency. Two words on why it was so hard to get the climate target agreed. Why did it take all night? Well, I think the basic issue was that uh, some member states wanted to get guarantees and assurances uh, that when they go for the minus 50 or when the EU goes for the minus, minus 55 uh, percent uh, target, that they will not be uh, who have to carry uh, the burden and uh, other, the, the, uh, the real burden and others just the light burden. So, uh, for example, for some it's definitely going to be easier if you're privileged by nature, like is uh, Sweden, uh, for example, uh, to reach these objective is uh, much easier and cheaper than, for example, if you're Poland and your economy very heavily relies on, on coal. Uh, another is uh, some countries are have a higher GDP and uh, others don't. And uh, this to be taken into account uh, is what uh, many member states, uh, especially from, from Eastern Europe and also Malta, uh, uh, did like uh, to see. But uh, time span was too short, I mean, to uh, spell this out um, in, in detail, because that is, uh, presupposes a negotiation that will talk, uh, take uh, many months. And first of all, you need to have an impact assessment. Uh, so uh, if we would have gone for that, that would have meant uh, that uh, we push uh, this decision to some time uh, in summer, but it needed to be taken because of the climate conference already on uh, Friday morning. And this was kind of the friction. And then you try to hammer out some language, which uh, some member states find as a guarantee. And others say, well, there's something that we can accept right now because uh, uh, nobody exactly knows uh, what it means. So this was a difficulty to find some language uh, which satisfies all sides. Thank you very much. And let's turn uh, before we close to the Portuguese presidency. A question from Andre Campos. I would like to ask Ambassador Klaus, what are his, his ex expectations for the Portuguese presidency? Namely, which are the biggest challenges and which should be the main goals? Uh, and someone else asks, is the migration issue the most complicated problem from the EU right now? And what could the Portuguese do, assuming they can, uh, what could they do that you could not? So how do you see the challenge ahead for for the Portuguese and then I know Daniela has to leave us a couple of minutes before we end so I want to come to identifying some priorities for the next year but Ambassador what are your expectations for Portugal and the challenge they face? I think they will face uh, the same constraints uh, the same challenges as uh, we did and so this will also be a corona presidency this is not going to change in the next uh, couple of months so um, 
they will need to expect uh, like we did the unexpected uh, there will need to be a lot of improvisation and then i mean it's very clear on which fields uh, they will have to work this is going to be COVID coordination this is going to be migration uh, this is uh, going to be for example the future of, of europe uh, conference and many other things uh, that uh, we will not be able uh, to do and uh, that uh, they they uh, will need to, to focus on uh, thank you, Daniela. You do have to leave us in a minute, but if I could, by way of a conclusion, and it's the same question uh, to all three of you. Um, if you were a school teacher and you were marking Ambassador Klaus's work over the last six months, in a few words, how would you sum up in his end of term report uh, this presidency and its successes or failures? And if you were also, still that school teacher and setting homework for the next two presidencies uh, for Portugal and Slovenia to follow, what would your key task be that you would give them? So how do you sum up Ambassador Klaus's and his and Germany's performance and the key homework for the next two presidencies? Same question to you all. Well, luckily, we are in a business where marks don't tell you the whole story. So we have to look at the complexity of the matter. Um, I guess, you know, the workload was enormous and the uh, element of, you know, unexpected challenges were, were simply huge. Um, Germany was among those countries uh, which in the first half of 2020, um, you know, pulled up borders, uh, restricted exports of medical material and so on and so on, but then self-corrected and I think contributed to the EU self-correction. Um, through a really initiative that it showed and it went beyond uh, its role as the EU presidency of an honest broker uh, when it proposed uh, the recovery fund and actually took a very you know, strong and forward leaning position together with France. I think that was absolutely uh, what was needed in that situation. As I said earlier, I have some grievances on uh, the rule of law conditionality um, and we need to watch and that brings me to uh, the outlook to the year 2021 um, and, and the Croatian um, presidency, uh, the Portuguese presidency. Um, now, Ambassador Klaus has said maybe it's a matter of two months. If that were so, um, that would be very good if we knew more uh, on the way uh, the conditionality um, is actually used. But if I look at the first half of the year 2021, it is very clear that there are a number of strategic challenges out there. Um, the US president will come into office uh, in January, and there is a moment where the EU should ideally position itself with a forward leading um, transatlantic idea and an agenda. There's a first statement out there, but this is really uh, the important strategic question of the year 2021. Where does Europe stand in that relationship? And with that, also with regard to China. Thank you very much. And Daniela, I know you have to slip away. Uh, so thank you so much for being with us. Thank you to DGAP for Project Presidency and thank you for co-hosting today's event. Very much appreciated and slip away because I know you're expected at another event in a couple thank of minutes. You, uh, I'm going to come to Yanis now because I'd like to give the ambassador the last word. Yanis, um, accepting that this is an oversimplistic question, I'm not asking you to give marks out of 10, but in a few words on the end of term report, what would you say about this presidency and what would your homework be for Portugal? I will not slip away. I'll dare to give a mark. And I think the mark I would be give is a, is a B plus. Um, it has done under very difficult circumstances a very good job. So the fact that it's not an A it has only to do with the circumstances of reality surrounding the German presidency. So I think that Ambassador Klaus, his team in Brussels, all those involved in Berlin have done their utmost. And I think a big thanks, and it's we should have probably mentioned that also early, has to go to the German Chancellor because the role she played in July, the role she played in December, so the role she played during the most difficult moments of this presidency was enormous. Um, and uh, without her, I dare to say that we would probably not have reached uh, the compromises which were reached, which often were extremely complex and extremely difficult. So we will miss her once she will be gone. Indeed, that uh, the second life after Merkel has begun and most people greeting it with horror. The homework for the, the Portuguese? I think the homework for the Portuguese, well, 
Ambassador Klaus is right. It will be a, a Corona presidency, both in terms of the subjects it needs to deal with, but also in terms of the circumstances it will have to operate with. But I think both for the Portuguese, but also for the Slovenian presidency, the major challenge is to prepare ourselves for the post COVID-19 reality. This is what we now have as a major challenge in front of us. And that means that we need to deal with all the difficult aspects of it, the challenges of it, but also with the potentials of a post COVID-19 reality. But it, because I think that we often concentrate, which is normal in times of crisis, on the mega challenges we're facing. Yeah. Um, but we also need to be sure that we are aware of the potentials which this crisis gives us with respect to also reforming the European Union. Uh, Daniela was referring uh, to the EU-US relationship. Um, migration is another issue. I think the Conference on the Future of Europe will play a role. Um, so thinking about what Europe should look like post-19 um, COVID uh, is something which I put high on the agenda in an abstract form. Thank you very much. And Ambassador, a final thought from you before we end, sir. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm glad you did ask me about a week ago on uh, our major <laughs> achievements uh, during the German presidency, because uh, there would not have been uh, so much uh, to show for. But now with the MFF, next generation EU and the conditionality mechanism, uh, the package agreed, uh, the budget uh, 2021 and this huge progress on climate. So uh, I, I can uh, say that uh, I believe uh, we met uh, the expectations. <laughs> And as for the uh, Portuguese presidency, I mean, as I said previously in line out, so nothing, nothing to add on that. And on that note, sir, thank you so much for finding the time. I know you're still very busy. We still have the B word, the small uh, matter of the unfinished business of Brexit. We still have many things you have to do between now and the end of the year. But thank you so much to you. Thank you, Yanis. Thank you to Daniela in her absence. Thank you to all of you. Thank you for your many questions. We managed to touch on at least about a dozen of them. Uh, there were many more. I do apologize that we couldn't get to them all, uh, but we squeezed quite a lot in. So thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you to Project Presidency for a fascinating six months of discussions and debates. Good luck for the last two weeks, Ambassador. Uh, and it only remains for me to wish you all a very pleasant Christmas. Enjoy yourself despite the constraints. Stay safe and goodbye. Thank you, Thank Jackie. You. Thank you very much. Stay Thank safe. You so much, Thank you. Bye. Bye.